Hello everyone, today on Scottish Memories I am chatting to Sarah Stewart. So how are you all? Hope you are all happy and healthy and safe out there wherever you are. Just before we get started, if you haven't already, please remember to hit that like button, hit that subscribe button, leave a comment. But today I am really, really excited. I am chatting to Sarah Stewart. Sarah is a Scottish actress with an incredible line of work. You'll recognise her from things like Drop the Dead Donkey, Minder, Men Behaving Badly, Mrs Brown with Billy Connolly and Judi Dench, Rebus, Monarch of the Glen, Wire in the Blood, A Touch of Frost, Robin Hood, New Tricks, Secret Diary of a Call Girl, Ashes to Ashes, Transformers The Last Night, and of course Christopher Nolan's Dark Knight where she is Batman's mum. Sarah, hello, how are you? Hello, I'm very well thank you, how are you? I'm very, very well. Thank you so much for sparing the time and coming on and chatting, it genuinely means the world. Oh, that's so nice. And I, I have to point out the extra guest in the room, <laughs> the elephant <laughs> in the room, um, who's got very used to being attached to me like Velcro during lockdown. So she's, um, she might disappear halfway through, but at the moment. Yeah, my two are exactly the same. We're, <laughs> I'm genuinely worried about, you know, when, when life gets back to yes. normal and we're not going to be in the house as much, they're, they're, they're going to be devastated. It's a genuine problem. I was reading about it the other day because dogs have, this has been like the best time ever for dogs. They're like, yeah, everyone's yeah. around all the time. I'm going for loads of walks. It's like, you know, yeah, she's super attached to me and I and I am worried about it. But we'll yeah, the, it when we get to it. Yeah, I know. The only, the only upside uh, we've got here now is, like I, I mentioned just before we got started properly, that we've now got a four-month-old. So mm -hmm. our circumstances has changed here a little bit. My wife is going to be here a little bit more, so the dogs aren't going to be, you know, as much alone. But mm -hmm. even now, if, if I go out to do essential shopping or anything, that short period, they're like, oh, I don't like it. No, you stay in all the time now. That's what you do. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's it, You get back and it's like you've been away for six months, isn't it? Yeah, it really is. But there's nothing better than a warm welcome of a dog in the house, though. Very, there's nothing I, I just, better. Yeah, dogs are the best. No, no. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll dive right in. So you're Edinburgh-born. I'm from Edinburgh. Hi. Yeah. Originally. Much much like myself, much like myself. So how, how much time did you, because I know you, you moved about a bit. How much time did you spend? Growing, yeah, how much did time spend in Edinburgh? Uh, well, I was born there, but my yeah. parents weren't Scottish. They were American. Right, yeah. So um, we always, uh, growing up, I always felt a little bit like we were a bit exotic. In fact, we were so exotic that in the 60s, I think the Evening News or the Standard did a, a two-page spread on this American family that's emigrated to Scotland. You know, it was really yeah, because it was that unusual. Yeah, everyone was going the other way. Yeah, and Scottish people going to America, not American people coming to Scotland. So, um, yeah, I grew up in Edinburgh. Went to Flora Stevenson's Primary School and Broughton High School. Nice. And um, then I left when I was seventeen. And I, because I had dual nationality, I, and I went over to America, and then I went to London when I was 19, I went to drama school, and I've sort of based myself in London ever since. I've lived in America a couple of, like, short times, but mainly London. Mm -hmm. So the, the, from uh, essentially zero to 17, though, it was, yeah. it was mostly Edinburgh then? Mostly Edinburgh. Oh, I mean, yeah. I mean, apart from our holidays. And... Um, I was saying, come on the other day, you know, oh, hello, Maisie, there's a friend for you. <laughs> that, that's, that's my two boys in the background saying, it'll, 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 probably, it'll probably be the postman. They don't like the postman. <laughs> They're very typical dogs. They're like, oh, someone's putting something in the door. <laughs> um, so, um, yeah, you know, I mean, it's, it's a, such a, a sort of iconic city, isn't it? That I still have, dream, I dream about Edinburgh. And, and when I go back, um, it's so, it's almost like it's got a personality of its own, you know, like, and yeah. you can see, I can still see the same cracks in the old paving stones and the, all that stuff that was there when I was, that's Edinburgh Council for you, eh? <laughs> <laughs> it's funny you say that though, me and my wife, yeah. um, just for, just for the sake of it, I don't know if you remember, but Billy Connolly did a series in the 90s called World Tour of Scotland. 
And the last episode of that was all Edinburgh. So mm. I, I did a, I did a, I really wanted to to have it because I used to have it on VHS tape, and mm. obviously that's that's long gone. I didn't have it on on DVD or anything, so I wanted to get it. I found it and I watched the last episode of Edinburgh, expecting it to be quite dated. Mm-hmm. And then I watch it, and you go, you know what? That and that's that was ninety four. It was filmed. I'm like, mm-hmm. it's not that different. I mean, template Lothian Road is very different. There's been a yeah. lot of, kind of building up around there, where the ABC Cinema used to be. That's all yeah. changed up there. Oh, the ABC! Yeah, mm. I remember going to the ABC a lot when I was young. Well, I think it was parents used to sort of pan their kids off, didn't they? And it, it, yeah. it, a Saturday morning cinema club or something. I used to yeah, that, that, that rings a bell. Yeah, and um, there would be cartoons and like Laurel and Hardy films and stuff like that. And chaos. I mean, kids just going mental and throwing sweets around. And, yeah. and there was no, in in those days, but there was no kind of, you had to come in at the beginning of the film. You could come in at any point and it would be on a loop. And you could just yeah. sort of sit there. You'd watch the second half first and then stay and watch what happened in the beginning. Yeah, the yeah. End. Um, yeah, the ABC, so many memories of going there. My, I remember my, my first kind of grown-up film that, my dad decided I was old enough to watch age 11, was Jaws. Traumatized uh, for 11? life. Oh, traumatized for life, sitting in the front row, you know, like this with tears running down my face. Yeah. Well, I'd, I've got a very similar memory. I remember um, watching it with my mum, and I was young. I was young. This was, a, a, I think it was VH renting. I'm back on VHS tapes mm-hmm. again randomly. Renting has <laughs> fairly new. And I think sitting with my mum, and I could only be in six or seven, and that scene where the head just pops out of the boat, <laughs> the two of us were, I was traumatised. I, I was traumatised, absolutely I, traumatised by Jaws. I mean, I still, if I if I enter the sea, I hear, you know, dun, 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 dun. it's just... It's just cello it's players trip. under the water. Yeah, exactly, yeah. <laughs> The yeah. funny thing is about the cinema as well, I, I was telling... Um, my wife um, sort of missed this. Uh, multiplexes had sort of, of coming in. But I remember having to look in the newspaper to find out where the film you wanted to watch was playing. Yeah. You know, because it wasn't multiplexes. They weren't all in no. one place. You had to go, right, okay, the ABC's got that and the Dominion's got that, so we need right. to go to that one. If we... And yeah. if you said that nowadays, I think kids would be like, what? Mm-hmm. Well, they wouldn't leave the house. They can just stream everything, can't they? Well, there is that. There is that as well, especially especially now. You're not allowed to go anyway. Exactly. (laughs) So growing up then, Mm -hmm. how much of a chance did, if you had American parents who were here, I'm assuming they wanted to explore Scotland a little bit. If they came over here, did you you do sort of staycations around Scotland? Yeah, my mum was right into all of that. I mean, the minute there was a bank holiday or, you know, anything, she'd throw me in the car. And off we go, driving around Scotland. I think I've probably been to every castle and stately home that exists. Um, and it wasn't my idea of fun as a kid. And also because <laughs> she was, it really wasn't. It was just like, oh, God, here we go again. Here, another stately home. Um, and she was really into all the history of Scotland and all that. So I would always have to hear about the Stuarts, you know. Yeah. Um, but of course, as I get older, I really appreciate it. And um, and now, if I'm ever in Scotland, I jump in the car and I and I want to get up to the Highlands and I want to drive around up, especially the northwest coast. I just love it up there. Yeah, and then the thing is, like, like we were kind of just saying at the beginning as well, you could go there and it would be exactly the same. Yeah, it, it won't. We're, we're we're kind of lucky that way that we're yeah a nation of. I mean, there's only five and a half million. Which is when you say it out, yeah, there's only five and a half million. There's more people in London than there are in the whole of Scotland. There's like 20 million in London, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Wow, that's amazing. So when you think of the land, it's actually, there's very little space with anyone on it. Yeah. Very little space with people on it, sorry, is what I mean. And the mountains don't change, do they? No, 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 it's not as if we're going to, you know. Yeah, and there is, you're right, there's something incredibly reassuring about that it's like a touchstone isn't it like you can always go back and it's still there that loft yeah. that mountain that view that whatever it is that you connected to years and years ago is still there 
It's very rare. I suppose my mum and dad, um, I've said this a couple of times in various interviews, my mum and dad are still in the same house. They're in their 70s now, but they're in the same house that I grew up in. Oh, lovely. So most of the areas stayed the same, most mm. of it. If anything, it's expanded a little bit. And that's the bit that you notice, you know. I mean, you go, oh, that 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 was a, that was a, a cornfield or whatever, and then mm-hmm. all of a sudden it's a set of houses. It's just the little bits like that, and yeah. the distance that look different. For most part, though, the streets exactly the same. Half the neighbours are still the same. Yeah. Um, so it's it's nice to go. It's nice that there's these little connections that that stay. You know what I mean? That sort of continuity in your life, isn't it? Yeah, it is. It's lovely. It's lovely. And, and of course, in the world. Sorry. Mm-hmm. In an ever-changing world and in uncertain times, it's nice to have that kind of continuity. Yeah, it is. It is. So when you used to get taken around Scotland mm. on, on these elaborate castle holidays, is there anywhere that, that sticks <laughs> they in They weren't you? elaborate, you... but uh, yeah. <laughs> my mum was really slow. She was a really slow person. And I, as a child, was quite, you know... I was child? Like, I was yeah. a child. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. Um, but she was one of those people like, you know, you go to like an art gallery with somebody and, and they they read every single little thing under yeah. the painting and they've got to give the painting its full five minutes or whatever it is, you know. And I'm one of those, I kind of get the feel of it. And if there's one I'm really interested in, I'll hone in. But otherwise, you know, that she was that methodical kind of. So we had that. But one of my favorite memories, actually, it's got nothing to do with castles or anything like that. But um, we'd always stay in B&Bs and um, there was one very rainy night that we pitched up at a, D- a B&B. I think it was in Dornoch um, and I was probably about eight and they had a lovely big lab dog um, and a fire and they put the telly on and it was singing in the rain. And I, I remember it so vividly because it was the first time I'd ever seen it. And yeah. it remains one of my all-time favorite films. But I love singing in the rain. Uh-huh. I love singing in the rain. Right. So that was it. Was a little kind of slice of heaven: a dog, and singing in the rain, and a fireside in Dornoch. Yeah. yeah. It's funny the little memories that stay, though, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, it, I mean, I'm the same. I can remember um, my dad. I, my dad. Um, during the week, I mean, he, he was the same as, as most people did. He was working most of the time. Mm-hmm. Um, and then on a, I can always remember on a Saturday, that's when I would do something with my dad because that's mm-hmm. when he would have time. So we'd go out. And so, but invariably, it was things that he wanted, he needed to do because it was his day off. So he needed to do mm-hmm. things. And then I came along. But it's just these, it's not, it, I can remember going holidays with mom and dad and all these little things. But sitting in the car with my dad, Driving around Edinburgh as he did the things he needs to do, listening to Dire Straits and Queen. Mm-hmm. That's the you know it's these little bits, these random little mm-hmm. memories that you go, yeah, that was great, that was yeah. lovely. Yeah, and it's become part of you, hasn't it? It's forms yeah. your taste and how you see the world, and yeah, yeah, it's yeah. nice little things like that. Though. It's, mm-hmm. it's funny how these little things stick with you, isn't it? But then again, singing in the rain, I mean, that's a classic. It is. My Saturday mornings were. Um, my mum, she was a sort of New Yorker, really, and um, she was, you know, she didn't know how to do her own hair. She was that generation. Right. She never washed her own hair. She had no idea what to do with it. So every Saturday morning was a wash and set at the hairdryer, at the right. hairdresser. Right. There'd be a whole row of them, you know, sitting with those things on the heads. Yeah. And, and me, again, bored out my mind, saying, oh, God, yeah, how yeah. long would we be here? And a were, you, were you an only child? No, I had an older brother who's three years older than me. Mm. Right. So, all right. So, there's a bit of a gap then, a bit more play yeah. of things. Because I, I, I had similar. I, I'm, I'm an only child, or what I used to call a lonely child, and oh. it was with my mom and dad all the time. You know, what I mean, it was dra- mm-hmm. getting dragged along to wherever it was, just going, oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. But it was that sort of thing. So, as you obviously, as you've uh, grown up and like you said, I, sorry, I'm going to jump back a little bit. Mm-hmm. For your mum, if you, she had this sort of New York sort of, uh, I don't want to, uh, yeah, that's the word yeah. I was looking for. I didn't want to use it, but yeah, mentality. Edinburgh must have been very different for them. Mm, uh, that's why they liked it. They actually met at Edinburgh University, I think, in um, 1959, maybe. Right, uh, okay. Doing, uh, doing a summer course. No, they didn't 
get their degree there, but they did a summer course there. And um, they were intoxicated by it. And it was kind of an exciting time. There were a few Americans around at the time um, doing things and um, feeling like, you know, I don't know, they, they, I think they felt sort of quite radical. And when they went back to America... They, they would do for Edinburgh in the 50s and the 60s. They would have been... I know, but, well, America even more so, you know, it was McCarthy and everything like that. And they were just really disenchanted with, with Edinburgh and loved, I mean, not with Edinburgh, with America, and loved Edinburgh. So when they went, they got pregnant with my brother and went traveling around Europe, I think, and then just decided they better stop somewhere and have him. And they, <laughs> they came, it was as random as that. They came to Edinburgh because they knew a few people here. That makes so perfect sense. Was, lived on Rose Street. Um, so my, they, had, they didn't have hot running water. You know, it was really kind of, Romantic in a way. Um, and then they didn't even know what they wanted to do with their lives. I think it was after that that my dad trained to be a teacher. He taught at Liberton High School. Right. And he was head of English there. And my mum trained to be a social worker. Um, but that all took time, you know, evolving and a family evolving and all that yeah. sort of stuff. And the, yeah, no, they, they had they had very little love for, for America and a lot of love for Scotland. Yeah. That's beautiful. That's lovely. It's funny when you were talking there and you went, I mean, on Rose Street nowadays, that would be God knows how much it would cost to, to stay on Rose Street now. Yeah. When you, when you said they didn't have hot running water, I remind, I remind remember, do you remember Francie and Josie? Ricky Fulton? Um, yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. Just reminded me of a joke. They said, oh, I've got a lovely place. It's got running water down the walls. It's great. It's lovely. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I imagine it was a bit like that. Um, so after that, obviously you've grown up, and but you came back and you filmed here a few times as well. So you did. Well, couple I was actually target. before I spoke to you, I was sort of making a little list of all the times I've worked in Scotland, and I was thinking I've actually worked in Scotland a lot because I got my equity card at Pit Lockery. Oh, did you? Right. Yeah. Okay. So I did the summer season up in Pit Lockery, um, which was just fantastic. It was yeah. Anna Chancellor was in the same. Um, season as me and we've yeah. become great friends we were friends ever since um, but lots of climbing mountains and you know having to stop the car to let a rabbit cross and all of that sort of <laughs> I mean I just loved it and of course the theatre there has a salmon ladder outside the dressing rooms it's really idyllic really I didn't know yeah, that it's strange you watch the little salmon going like this upstream <laughs> it's amazing that's amazing oh it's just gorgeous have you never been I've not, not to the not to the that side of the theatre. No, Pit Lockery. I tend I, me for randomly. Pit Lockery is a place that me and my wife just end up at sometimes. Yeah. Great way to the Highlands. It, it really is. It really yeah. is. It is, but it's beautiful. Pit Lockery oh, is absolutely gorgeous. beautiful. Yeah, um, so I, yeah. I had that summer in the Highlands, and then I had. Um, I I was I filmed a series five, I think, of Monica of the Glen. So I had that summer in the Highlands. That was gorgeous, up by Newton Moore and um, Canusi up that way. Yeah. And we had um, access to the private loch of the house that we all filmed, that the series was filmed in, which had its own like loch side beach. Wow. Completely deserted. Wow. And it was a heat wave that summer. So London was unbearable, you know, hitting 100, I think. And um, the Highlands were, was just perfect temperature. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that, must have, that must have been incredible. You no, know, it was amazing. And I had my kids then and they came up for the summer as well because it was the holidays. And we've just got such great memories of it. It's one the of the things that people don't realise is Scotland actually has some beautiful beaches. Beautiful beaches. But the glory of it is, is also that they're really quiet. It's because it's freezing in the water. <laughs> <laughs> but not on a loch. So that was the thing, because it's really shallow. If it's been summertime and the and the sun's been on it and it's yeah. shallow loch water, it actually warms up. It manages to heat it up. Wow. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's like a swimming pool. I mean, it's just heaven. Yeah. Absolute heaven. Yeah. 
So is there any places now that obviously, I mean, you're well, not now because we're not getting a chance to go anywhere. But there's if you get the chance to come and film, you go, oh, I love it when we when I'm working there. Is, do you have a favorite area to work? Um, well, wherever I'm working, I'll always at the weekend, I'll always go and explore. Right. Um, <clears throat> I mean, I did the last job I did in Scotland was a tour actually of Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf with Rapture Theatre. And I love Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf. Me too. I've been, yeah, yeah. that was the role I wanted to play all my life. And so when I got the chance, I jumped. And um, so we did a tour uh, all over Scotland, you know, St Andrews, Stirling, East Kilbride. Um, I can remember, uh, people's, I mean, doing just sort of, you know, a couple of nights here and there, a sort of outreach theatre. And then we ended up at the King's in Edinburgh and the King's in Glasgow. And the King's in Edinburgh, for me, because I did panto there with Stanley Baxter when I was nine, I think. You worked with Stanley yeah. Baxter? Wow. I with Stanley Baxter, yes. That's um, amazing. Yeah, amazing, amazing. Um, and I was one of those little kids that runs around on the stage being a villager or a gnome or whatever I was. <laughs> but I was so starstruck by Stanley Baxter. He had this incredible kind of presence and charisma. And I can, and, and I remember which dressing room was his dressing room. And when I went back to do Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf, I was like, can I have Stanley Baxter's dressing room, please? And, um, and I had it. And it was just this lovely, you know, sort of circular journey. Um, but that's another place that's not changed, backstage. Like the minute I was backstage at the Kings, I was like, oh my God, this is exactly what it was like in the 70s. Yeah, yeah, I think that's one of those things. Uh, theaters theaters yeah. are one of these places that yeah. they do get frozen in time a little yeah, bit. Exactly. Just, this is it. Yeah. Um, yeah I mean, and the Kings as well, it, it's, it's such a beautiful theater. Yeah, it's great. It's great. Uh, it's it's quirky. I mean, it's at the front of house wise, you know, bar wise, they're tiny and they're and they're tucked in corners. But when you're in that auditorium, it is it's got such character. It really has. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, theatre at the moment, it's all in a very precarious position. But hopefully, yeah, yeah, it's kind of, it's kind of scary, isn't it? Mm. They're just they're just all sitting all sitting empty for almost a year, which is. Yeah. Just I was uh, when I interviewed Alan Stewart um, uh, mm. a little while ago. Now he was doing his cabaret sort of style show at the Kings. He was do he was doing it there with uh, Grant and Andy and things, and they managed to do their last show. And then the next day, all theaters got shut. So he just managed to squeeze it in at the Kings, and then and now we're still waiting for them to open up again. Yeah. It's kind of heartbreaking, isn't it? Uh, it is kind of heartbreaking, but, you know, we just have to keep the faith. Yeah, mm. it'll come. We'll get there. We will get there. We will get there. Mm. Um, so, well, you've, uh, all these sort of travel around Scotland, uh, shown in Scotland, how often do you, outside of pandemic, how often do you yeah. get a chance just to come up then and, and, and see the place? Well, not, not enough, truthfully, because I don't have any family there anymore. And also most of my friends moved away to London, LA, kind of, you know. Yeah. Um, so if I do go, it's just purely as a kind of tourist, which always feels a little bit weird to me. I feel like I, it's just an odd feeling not yeah. to be long when you're there, you know, not to have a reason. I get that. Though. I get that. Because I lived in London for six, coming on seven years after I, after I went to drama school and then when I worked down there for a while. And even now, when I go down, there's part of me still still feels like I live there a little bit. And it's been, you know, 15, 16 years since I moved away. Um, but so uh, when, even though I'm there as a tourist, I'm still like, oh, I, I, I kind of feel like I live here, but I don't. It's, it's a weird feeling, isn't it? It is a really weird feeling, especially in Edinburgh. I'll be, if I'm on George Street, I'm like looking for the number 13 bus, <laughs> which I have to say is like spotting a unicorn. It was the yeah. least frequent bus in Edinburgh. <laughs> um, and now, of course, if I'm in, I'm there, I'm like, why did I even want to get a bus? It's like a 15 minute walk away. But, you know, your boundaries shrink when you're in as well. Yeah, of course it is. But, and then again, there's always a thing of no matter where you're going in Edinburgh, whether you're going or coming back, you're always going uphill. 
That is the other thing I really notice when I'm back is the wind. Yeah. And the hills. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it is incredible because obviously I'm out whenever I get the chance I'm out wandering about and I'm filming and I'm learning mm. more history and I'm to, to share with everyone and I'm like I'm always out of breath I'm always walking up a hill yeah very good very healthy for you but yeah the wind I mean I can remember as a girl we used to play lean in the wind that was one of our games we would play to like to see who would trust themselves to actually put their full weight into the gale force wind that was <laughs> howling around you. And then, of course, if you haven't lived there for a while, you become a little bit of a southern softy and you go back and you're like, oh, my God, it's so cold. Yeah. <laughs> and it gets in your bones and all that stuff. But. It really does. You just reminded me of a game that I used to play at school as well. I used to get, when it was windy, you used to get your jacket and fold it up the other way, oh, yeah. like a sail, and try to fight <laughs> against it. And then you'd invariably see like 10 of us lying on the ground just going, ah. Oh. <laughs> yeah, we used to stand on the um, playing fields at, at, at school, kind of prodding our legs to see whose blood came back fastest. <laughs> because it was sort of, you know, they sort of mottled, you know, like pale grey. We, or we used to call it fire tartan, actually, because you'd get it sitting in front of one of those like bar heaters, you yeah. know, before the, before the days of central heating. Yeah. And you'd, and you'd get like roasted on the front and you'd still be freezing on the back. And your legs would go funny. They'd go like all kind of like mottled. And we called it fire tartan. And we used to get it on the playing fields when we were freezing as well. And, yeah. and we'd depress our thumb and watch the blood come back slowly. <laughs> I'm, get, I'm getting a random memory as well. If I can remember <laughs> if it was well, playtime or lunchtime at school yeah. and the weather was awful, it would have to be almost a hurricane for the yeah. teachers to go, okay, okay, you can spend it in sight. Because they didn't want to, you know, they didn't want to lose their 50 minutes or hour break from us. And I can, I yeah, can remember yeah, us yeah. being outside drenched, <laughs> not being allowed to go in. I'm sure they wouldn't be able to do that nowadays. I'm sure they would, but I remember. <laughs> yes. Or they'd have created a little shelter now or something. Yeah. 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 Go in there, stand in there. You're fine. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So if anyone's going to come to Scotland, because obviously, yes. as, I, as I kind of touched on before, I'm very fortunate. I get people, expats, uh, people with Scottish heritage, or people just planning a holiday. And a lot of people yeah. are, I've had yeah. vet messages from all over the world of people having to plan and replan, unfortunately, mm. over the course of the last year, because people mm. have had cancellations and things. But if you got any top tips for anyone mm -hmm. thinking about coming over? Well, I mean, I do feel that you have to see Edinburgh. I think Edinburgh is just, it's one of the most beautiful cities in the whole world. Um, I'm not, not going to argue there, really. I mean, really Athens is. in the north. Athens in the north. It really is. And, and, and growing up there, actually, I realised I was a bit spoiled because you just think that's the way the world is. And then you get out into the world and you're like, oh, <laughs> it's not, oh not, yeah. it's not like you, that. Yeah, you, you, you really yeah. notice how beautiful our buildings are when you're, not, when you're beside any other city, really, aren't you? Yeah, yeah, it's gorgeous there. So that's a must-see. And if you can get to the fringe of the festival, I would say... You know, that's an amazing time of year. Um, and then it, was strange, it was strange this year not to have it. Oh, and you haven't heard yet if, if it's going to be this year or not, have you? Still don't know, still don't know. But I went out, because we would ease lockdown, I went out into Edinburgh in August. And to be on the Royal Mile in the middle of August and be the, virtually the only person there, it was mm. a very strange feeling. It was a very strange really, feeling. Really, really strange. Well, we'll see. Fingers crossed. Um, yeah. But then um, I do. I then sort of want to go over to the west once I've done Edinburgh. Sorry to everyone else in the east. No, oh, I love the west coast, and so because um, I was working in Glasgow, I was staying in Glasgow for rehearsing. Um, Who's afraid of Virginia Woolf? And we played the Glasgow Kings and all the rest of it. And I've never really spent that much time in Glasgow, as you know. There's never. The, the crossover is, I mean, it's so it's, close. I know, it's 50 miles it's away. Graphically yeah. close, it's unbelievable. But, you know, there was that saying, the best thing to come out of Edinburgh is the train to Glasgow and all that sort of stuff. Yeah. So um, the sort of rivalry between the two cities, which is rubbish. Anyway, um, so I grew to love Glasgow a couple of years ago when I was staying there. And the people, of course, just unbeatable, so friendly and funny. Yeah. And, brilliant restaurants and this just really vibrant kind of buzz to it. 
And it's yeah. funny, you're you're right. I love Glasgow. I'm the mm. same, and I'm 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 maybe we're a rarity, you know, Edinburgh people that that love Glasgow. But I think mm. it's got a, it's got a, for fifty miles, it's got such a different character and a different feel. Totally different. You yeah. Could, you, from from one east coast to the west coast, you could really get to know the people of Scotland and how different we are. Yeah. But at the same time, very similar. Yeah. And then. Um, I love the drive from Glasgow up to Loch Lomond. And I love Loch Lomond. Yeah. Well, and then yeah, on good. up the West Coast, up my my places that I always want to go to are Pitlochry. Not Pitlochry. Uh, Plockton. I love Pitlochry too. I haven't been there for ages. Plockton. Where's Plockton? I don't think I've been to Plockton. Plockton. All right. Well, see, I'm giving you a handy hint. Now. Yeah. These are tips for me as well. <laughs> yeah. So Plockton um, is this tiny little fishing village on the west coast, kind of south of Ullapool and Sky. Right. And there's a fantastic hotel there called the Plockton Inn. And they do amazing seafood. And um, they have Kayleys, like not the dancey Kayleys, the music Kayleys. Yeah. Yeah. So people come and bring their instruments and sit around a fire and strike up. And it's just an amazing atmosphere. Beautiful. It's a beautiful, beautiful little village with this. You look out, there's a little sort of island on the water and it's absolutely gorgeous. So Plockton is one of my most favorite places in the whole world. And then if I can get up to Ullapool and across to Skye, I would, because I love it there too. Yeah. Um, my mum had a cottage in Orkney as well. So I used to spend quite a lot of time up in Orkney and I, I haven't been there for years, but Orkney is special, very yeah. special. And it's got so much history. It's unbelievable. All the sort of Neolithic all the way through to the modern age. And um, it's got the oldest human settlement in Europe, I yeah. think, 3000 BC or something. It's like the Flintstones. They've got little... Scarabray, it's called. Yeah, Scarabray, yeah yeah, 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 yeah. They've got little kind of like stone beds and little stone <laughs> bedside <laughs> tables and stuff. Um, and I think they lived underground. That's how they kept out of those gale force winds. That would make perfect sense, yeah. I'd, 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 do, that. I'd do that as well, yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> but yeah, the islands are, are special and just the whole kind of, because I love water and I love the sea and things, Wherever you go in Scotland, there's always water, isn't there? Because yeah. it's such a complex coastline that you're, there are loads of little villages on the coastlines and views up, from up those mountains and lochs and all of that. And um, yeah, love that. You're making me miss badly. I did, I, 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 I was, it's funny. I, uh, I I'm, I'm, I'm going back to past interviews, but um, one of the first interviews I did was Gordon Kennedy. Oh, yeah. And uh, he, uh, we, we ended up chatting about Luca's ice cream. Which, oh yeah, in Musselboro. Yeah, yeah. Which obviously is, if if you anybody Edinburgh or East Coast person knows Luca's ice cream as the best ice cream in the world. Yeah. And he was living in London, and this was this was strict lockdown at the time. And he was raging at me. He was like, "I'm itching for a Luca's ice cream now, and I'm 500 miles away, and I've got no idea when I'll be able to get it again." I'm yeah. like, "I'm sorry." <laughs> Don't they have one now opposite the Kings? Do they have a branch? They there? did for a little while. They had a couple. That I remember they, they had one. They had, they had a few pop up, and they've started their own version of Cornetto now as well. They've started their own kind mm. of little mm. Cornetto thing as well, which is yeah. No, we, had, we would have the big kind of you know exit. We would drive all the way to Musborough just to get ice cream. Yeah, and, and it wouldn't have melted by the time we got back. It was like a no. brick. Do you remember? You had to yeah, to wait, wait, and be like, "Is it soft enough? Is it soft enough?" Just wait a little longer. You know, eating. Yeah, I can. I can remember my dad every now and again. It'd be a treat. He would come home with a two liter. Yeah. You know, all it would surprise us with a two liter tub of ice cream, but he would always say, "Don't go to the freezer. Don't go to the freezer and get the thing. Stand there and get them to scoop two liter. He would get them to scoop two liters so that it was fresh and right. You know, it wasn't solid. Uh, it was ready to go by the time yeah, you got home. Yeah, that's a good idea. Yeah, but oh, I, I'm wanting a look as ice cream. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, I just, I, I always like to finish off with what I call top tips for uh, difficult questions for Scott. Sorry, but we've done the top difficult questions for Scots. Yes. So, uh, shortbread or tablet. 
Oh, well, when I was young, it would have been tablet, but now it would be shortbread, I think. And I'm a, bit I remember, high, a bit too high of the sugar now. I mean, you know, it's just sugar. That's all it is, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, it's just yeah. solid. Yeah, yeah, yeah but, but it, it was, um, yeah, it was one of those things people's grannies used to make, and that you like, you couldn't go to any kind of little fair or you know school fate or I don't know what they used to call them there's always in village halls I can't even remember what yeah, they were. yeah yeah like your Mayfair or something like that something yeah, like that, yeah. yeah. and uh, Beetle Drive I remember there used to be Beetle Drives in church halls um, and there would always be tablet yeah um, yeah, there would always be a little bake sale sort of yeah, table exactly. wouldn't there one of these pop up foldy tables and the, yeah tab, you're right tablet was always there yeah but now shortbread yum Shortbread and a cup of tea. Can't be, mm. can't be it. Can't be yeah. it. Uh, iron brew or whiskey? Well, I'm going to be a little bit unpatriotic and say neither. No, that's fair enough. That's fair that enough. They are, they're an acquired taste. They are. Well, iron brew, I think, always looks like it should sort of be on the set of Chernobyl or something. You know, <laughs> a little bit radioactive and, and like something I don't really want to put in my body. Um, and whiskey... I mean, I've done like whiskey distillery tours and all of that sort of stuff. And I love the atmosphere of whiskey, <laughs> tweed and fires and wet lab dogs and, you know, all that sort of stuff. But peat and moss and it just doesn't give me a good buzz, whiskey. It always makes yeah. me... I'm I'm I'm, I'm I'm trying to teach myself how to yeah. like it. It's never something I'm trying to learn about because I feel like I should. Yeah. But it, it it's it can be difficult. It can it's it, it like uh, there's no better description than an acquired taste. You I think you have to keep drinking mm. it to like it. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. And it seems like it, it seems like a thoughtful drink to me. It's like you drink and then sit there going, you know, like contemplate thinking, life. Thinking yeah, dark yeah. thoughts. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Uh, square sausage or black pudding? Oh, black pudding, probably. Yeah. yeah. I think so. That, yeah. That's one of the things for me, hated it as a kid, but now I don't know yeah. if my palate's changed or something, but yeah. I'm like, yeah, I like a bit of black pudding now. I mean, it's great with, um, I mean, I would, you know, I, I guess, again, this is probably heresy being Scottish. But I, I um, love a bit of black pudding with um, scallop and like crushed peas or something like that. Nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with that. It's funny. I just got a random memory. You, I think it's because the two things you've met, you, you, you told me about there, obviously um, exploring up the north, uh, the the west of Scotland, northwest Scotland, and then talking about black puddings and things. We were in a hotel at Fort William. And yeah. uh, talking about these little, you know, little hotels and things like that. And I remember the woman coming up and she uh, uh, she was saying what was for breakfast. And then she came out with a phrase, and the special today is potato scones. And then yeah. walked away. And then me and my wife were sitting there going, did she say the special was a potato scone? <laughs> <laughs> and just like, just like, okay, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, well, you know, it's a... It's a Maybe also an acquired taste. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, haggis, neeps and tatties or mints and tatties? Haggis. And that is the one time that I like whiskey. I With like a haggis? On, poured over haggis. Uh, I, I, I like a nice whiskey sauce or something. Just whiskey. Or, or just whiskey, poor bit. Whiskey, yeah. I've never tried that. I've never tried that. Yeah, it gives it, because it gives it, because it's quite fiery anyway, and it kind of gives it even more heat. Oh, oh, mm -hmm. I'd love to try that. Yeah, that's that's the way I take, any whiskey I take, I take it on haggis. Oh, see, I'm going to have to try that now. Mm -hmm. My wife's got me into, when I'm making the stuff in for Christmas dinner, mixing some haggis and with some sage and onion stuff in as well. Mm -hmm. And that, that is just delicious. Top tip. I like yeah. it. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's really good. Last but by no means least, Tunnock's tea cakes or caramel wafers? Caramel wafers all the way. Oh, there oh was my no, God. no hesitation there. I love them so much. And also, not just because they're so tasty, but... There's something, they're beautiful. I love the wrapper. 
and the design and again iconic and it's not changed no nope. i remember you know i used to go skating up at christoph and there used to be a, i don't know if it's still there and i used to yeah it's still there it's still there and um i'd always get a, a tonix wafer from the little kind of um you know sweetie shop there and we would sit with our the, with our thumbnails on the back of it and smooth it until it just became this really glossy kind of beautiful red and gold thing yeah yeah i mean you could make like a piece of art out of it <clears throat> you could do like i might do it actually might there was, my, I, my, I was the same order. i was the same where there was whenever i have a it's a tonic tea cake for me whenever i have a tonic tea cake i have to perfectly smooth out that silver smooth wrap out. ring because those <laughs> wrappings are beautiful as well yeah yeah that sort of thing and that, that's what i was going to say like a couple of years ago there was Urwilly statues uh -huh. all over Edinburgh and things and they'd got different art all over scotland sorry and they've got different artists to paint one each and one artist that that's what she does she works with tonics uh, tea cake wrappers so there was a full-size statue of Urwilly sitting on his bucket covered in tonic oh, tea cake wrappers. Lovely. Beautiful. I don't know what happened. It's kind of that. art deco, isn't it? The, the yeah. patterns on them. Yeah, gorgeous. What a great... Oh. Well, she's liked my idea now. I can't do my tonics. I mean, she did tea cakes. You're fine with the caramel wafer. Oh, right. Oh, I can do the caramel wafer then. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Sarah, this has been absolutely brilliant. Thank you so much for sharing your time with me. It genuinely oh, means the world. Lovely. lovely. And you've just made me hanker for Scotland. First opportunity, I'll be there. Well, we're, we're, we're always here. We're always here. Oh, That's the thing. You know, it doesn't matter how long you're gone from, from us. We're, you know, it's still in your heart. You can, you yeah. can be the same whenever you come back. And that's the thing. It will be exactly the same whenever you come back. <laughs> Brilliant. Oh, uh, Sarah, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Look after yourself. You too. That was brilliant that was incredible she's so lovely it's so nice of her to to share the time and come on and chat i hope you enjoyed that as much as i did sarah thank you so much um it genuinely means the world as always guys if you have enjoyed that please remember to leave a like leave a comment subscribe if you haven't already keep yourself safe out there until next time bye humans mm -hmm.